Welcome to the Star Pod Log Comic Scene with your hosts, Jeff and Tony. Hi, I'm Jeff Wiley. And I'm Tony Barletta. Welcome to Star Pod Log and the Comic Scene. Thanks for joining us. We're glad to be back with you guys. All right, so let's get into this. Uh, let's start our conversation by um, talking about how DC Comics has kind of uh, come back into the market. Um, there are people uh, that are saying that they have started to flood the market with books, and in some cases, uh, books with a $10 price tag. Tony, you've probably been to a comic shop more recently than I have. I was there at my LCS maybe two weeks ago, and I think you've been more recently than that. Tell me tell me what you saw there uh, from DC Comics. Yeah, I've been kind of surprised because, you know, coming off of uh, a complete shutdown of the industry where no comics were coming out for very many months and shops were low on cash because of that and they needed to get back in the swing of things. I think a lot of companies understood that, and they were taking things slow. DC was slow at first when they started shipping, but that was only to people that opted with the new distribution company. Uh, and then when they first started up, they were putting out, you know, three or four titles a week. Now they're put. It almost seems like they're trying to make up for the last two months, the April and May at one time, that they're putting out two months of product at once. Um, the amount of comics coming out of DC is by far greater than, than any publisher out there. Marvel's still taking it slow, uh, which is good. Other companies are still taking it slow. You know, DC recently had 80th anniversaries. So they had an 80th anniversary for Catwoman, an 80th anniversary Joker, and an upcoming 80th anniversary Green Lantern. All those books are coming out this month, they're all $10 books with multiple covers, hoping fans buy more than one copy. Uh, also, um, another book that just came out recently is, uh, you know, a beautiful book um, with an amazing cover and a and, and, uh, great writer and artist, B- Birds of Prey by uh, Brian Azzarello. And, um, you know, uh, it's a beautiful $10 book. And, you know, not only are they putting out two or three copies, you know, two or three issues of the same title in June, but they're putting out at least four, four ten dollars books in June. It's, it's really tough for fans. Uh, and it's, I'm sure it's tough for stores, too, because you're forcing them to buy that product, not knowing if fans are going to come in and buy it in this uncertain market. I, um, I watched some comic book content on YouTube. Uh, the, the business of comics, and, and how the money flows and how the money works has always been of interest to me. And one of the channels uh, that I watch talks about that regularly, and they had a guest on from a comic shop somewhere in New England. I can't remember where, but he said that the $10 books were flying off the shelf, which really surprised wow. me. And I wow. don't know if that's a reflection of people are just thrilled to have comics back or if people were picking it up like you said, the Joker 80th anniversary and the Catwoman 80th anniversary are both out there now, both $10 books um, with multiple variants. Uh, I mean, are people just snatching those up because they are uh, collector's items or because they are taking them home to read them because they did miss comics? Sure, I'll, I'll admit it. You know, I picked up uh, multiple copies of, of each, uh, two, two of the Joker, two of the Catwoman. The, the covers are... It gets the best cover artist out there, and it really is hard to limit, uh, you know, pick the, you know, the favorite cover of the ten, and that's that's why they do it so that people are tempted to buy more than one. Uh, but you know, the, the product they're putting out is a great product. I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, it, they're getting the best writers, the best artists, and on their best characters, and you know, they're putting a lot of pages in there, um, and. You know, on, on Birds of Prey, I mean, you have a cover by J. Scott Campbell. you got got um, writing by Brian Azzarello. So you're, you're getting a great product. Uh, it's just – it is an expensive product, though, and it, seem, it seems like it could be hurting some store. I'm sure some stores are, are great. Some stores are selling off the shelves maybe, but, but are all stores going to be that way, or, or is that going to hurt some stores? 
Uh, and that's a good question. That's a good question. And it's something that is yet to be determined. Um, yeah. You know, as, yeah. as the market begins to unfold and to, to that point, to follow up on something that we had discussed in a previous episode, um, I, I think it was our last episode that we recorded, the one on race relations, where I said that uh, Marvel had just announced they were going to do a free comic book day independent of – um, all the other publishers. Well, it turns out that Free Comic Book Day has become Free Comic Book Summer. And yeah. what it looks like is there's going to be uh, certain titles that are available every Wednesday in shops until, I believe it's September 9th. And that begins on July 15th, I believe. And that is going to be the first um, the first chapter in the new X-Men saga, X of Swords. Yeah, I mean, that's a great way to get people into the shops. Uh, free comic book day is always really popular, especially with kids. And, you know, people enjoy just reading a, a free comic book and seeing what, what the companies have out there. And so it'll get people out. It'll get, might get people to the store. The, the, I would say the challenge would be after people have been trained to expect that the first week of May, are, they, are, are people going to know it's going to be going on all summer long? Uh, so they need to promote it. So I think the promotion is going to – because most of the people that show up at the shops for the free comics are not the hardcore people that show up every Wednesday. Right. Um, so they're they're going to have to make sure that that's promoted to, you know, the general audience. Um, but, yeah, I think it's a great way to get people in the shops, a great way to get people engaged and thinking about comics again. So – uh, to your point, we were talking a minute ago, and you were saying how there's multiple variants and uh, for some of the 80th anniversary issues. And variant covers are a, a big thing and have been for many years. You and I are both old enough to remember when there were only one cover for a book that was issued. Yeah. Um, yeah. But but now, since I guess the 90s, sometimes variant issues have become a real thing and in many cases a hot collector's item because of the rarity of it or because of the specific art that's on the book and that will lead us to our main topic this episode and that is basically comic book art and the importance of it uh in in the medium yeah, it is it is an interesting point you just brought up about variants i think the the industry as we know it too has survived because of variants. Um, it's kind of difficult to, to gauge where sales would be without them because, you know, when you have a variant, you can only get if you're ordering, say, you know, 50 issues of a certain title or 100 issues. That store is buying issues they know they might not sell just to get that variant, and we we really don't know what a uh, comic book industry looks like without that incentive in there. No, we don't. And and it's I agree and it's really interesting that there are some some hardcore collectors and some even some shop owners that really don't like the idea of variants even 20 30 years into their existence that they think that they are bad for the industry. Then you have yeah, the flip know. side. I've always wondered, um, there's so many new online retailers that are re online only, and it seems within the last few years, a lot of those online retailers get their own variant that you can only buy at their online store. And so I, I've always wondered, how do comics shops feel about that? Because are they happy that they don't have to buy those extra comics? Or do they look at it and say, you know, I wish that um, they could sell the, that issue in their store? Um, you know, I've always wondered that it's 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 a new dynamic that didn't exist for, until the last couple of years. Can let me ask you this: Can a a good cover draw you into the book? Or uh, let me rephrase that: Can a good comic cover draw you into a book that you may not have otherwise been interested in? I have certainly picked up my fair share of comics. Uh, based on the cover art alone, just because uh, it, it just drew me in for whatever reason. So, sure, can a, absolutely, can a cover intrigue you to the point of purchasing the book. 
I would say uh, absolutely yes. I would say probably all comic book fans are going to say yes. And that's, I don't know if that existed back in the day. I think back in the day it was all, you know, stories. It was all writers and, and writing and art teams. But now today I think covers are, are that that important that they realize that people can buy a comic just for a hot uh, cover, just by a hot artist and a artist they really like. Um, and I, you know, it, I, I guess it makes sense um, because there's so many. That, I mean, you know, there's never been this many famous comic book artists before. And I know when I started in the '80s, I mean. We had great artists, we had great writers, but I don't think we had as many as we do today. So because there's so many different, really, really great, talented artists out there, it gives them that ability to, uh, you know, give that artist some more money to come over to their company, do a nice cover, and hope that, you know, it draws fans in just because of the cover. And, and to your point, um, there are lo- there are enough artists now or a number of artists whose names are synonymous with a specific character for example mark bagley is to many people the definitive spider-man artist yeah yeah i mean mark bagley's really gotten the look of spider-man um because of his long tenure on the title and over multiple decades multiple iterations of spider-man i mean he did the the Clone Wars Spider-Man. He did, you know, the uh, Ultimate Spider-Man Peter Parker. Uh, I think he was right there at the beginning of Miles Morales too. Um, you know, he he's he's done many modern day Spider-Man issues, and you know his his art looks nice on other characters too. But it, it is a, a perfect fit for him to draw Spider-Man. Absolutely. And there are certain artists who are, like you said, they get the character that they're drawing. Um, my favorite comic book character is Batman. I own more Batman comics than than um, than any other character. And Jim Lee is, to me, the definitive Batman artist, uh, at least for the modern era. Um, I think you could go back and talk about Neil Adams. Yeah, Neil I'll definitely Adams bring up Neil, yeah. Absolutely left his imprint on on the book and and we would be remiss if we didn't mention as a sidebar the the passing of Denny O'Neill absolutely uh, who passed uh, since we recorded our last episode he uh he paired with Neil Adams for the listeners that may not know he paired with Neil Adams on Batman and Green Lantern Green Arrow uh among others he also had a tremendous run on Iron Man yeah but, we talked uh, we talked the last episode about the contributions Denny had made with with Neil on Green Lantern and you know um the the famous panel of um asking Green Lantern what is, what has he done for the brown people lately um, right. you know De- Denny brought brought topics to comics that made people think um especially in Green Lantern I mean there's there's an issue there at Green Lantern Green Arrow where there's a character crucified right on the cover um and Denny never shied away from making people think he Introduced Ra's al Ghul, um, I think one of Batman's best villains ever. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, talking about the, the contribution of Neil Adams' art, I mean, I remember as a kid, I would walk into the drugstore to get comics after church, and uh, they were much, uh, cost a lot less than they do today. But I remember they had treasury sized editions, which were kind of new at the time. And it was a dollar, and I had to convince my mom to, for a dollar for to buy a comic. And it was uh, the Denny O'Neill, Neil Adams, Batman, uh, Ra's al Ghul, the f- one of the most famous covers, my favorite cover, where uh, Robin's laying there. He looks like he's dead, and Batman's there in agony over him, and Ra's al Ghul's behind him. It's, it's a striking cover. Um, yeah, Neil certainly made a, a contribution to Batman and, and Denny's stories uh brought them to life like no one else and also denny on the question i mean the, the, the question is a character oh, yeah. that he he was able i told him when i first met him that you know some of the stories he wrote in the question stayed with me longer than any story i've ever read because he he didn't make it easy on the reader the, the question 
it wasn't black and white. It was always shades of gray, and it was always showing even a person who isn't a good person or did bad things, maybe they have good qualities, or maybe they have other qualities. And it made people think more than just black and white. I mean, he uh, – good and bad. I mean, it was – you know, the, those question stories, uh, uh, you know, I think there was one where, um, uh, you know, it was like, you know, what have you done lately or something? And it was something to the effect, he was like going over all the lousy mistakes he'd made. I think he'd hit, I think he might have hit, hit, hit his girlfriend. I mean, he, he wasn't a great guy, but he was like, you know, I just tried to save a busload of kids. He's like, I'm trying to be a good, better person, you know? I mean, it's stuff yeah. like that that would just, you know – make me think um and that was that's what denny brought to comics and yeah he's certainly gonna be missed yeah denny o'neill i believe was 81 years old when he passed and wow. he, he left a uh he left a lasting imprint on the comics industry and definitely definitely a huge loss but, absolutely uh, I'm, I'm glad that he left us a, a, a long long list of books to to read Absolutely. So circle back to um, our conversation about artists. Um, who are some of your favorite artists, either uh, names that have been around a long time or up-and-coming names? Uh, you know, one name that jumps to me that really struck me when I first saw his work, uh, he, he over at Avatar, if you remember Avatar was the company out there that, put out Alan Moore and, and Warren Ellis comics and uh, uh, Anthony Johnson. Anthony Johnson, if you uh, recall, I think that's where he got his start was Avatar. He was the um, writer of the comic book that was turned into the Atomic Blonde movie. Um, oh, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, they always had really great writers. Um, and I remember Juan Jose Rip. That's I think it was the Warren Ellis comic at first, but then he he drew more for that company and he went over to Image. He even did some covers at Marvel. I mean, his the detail he puts into his work is astonishing. It's it, it's you know it's it's almost up there with Jeff Darrow, uh, you know, even George Perez, the master. I mean, it's it's that kind of dedication to detail. Um, I, I wish he'd draw more. Um, you know, his stuff really is is some of the best out there. I feel like one of the things we've seen less and less in recent years are whether it's an artist or writer, a, but a creator that is paired on a book or, or assigned to a book for a really long stretch of time. And I feel like that is key to finding that artist or that uh, character's essence. Like, for example, and I'm, I'm using um, – writers as examples but jeff johns worked on green lantern for 10 years uh dan slot was on spider-man for 10 years chris claremont was on x-men for i think 17 years but what we're seeing now is artists and writers that are on a book for you know maybe a dozen issues and then they move on to the next thing yeah you really don't see the level of commitment with uh long-term writers like you you did before i would guess there's even even no matter how popular it is even if you're looking at scott snyder um you're looking at uh jonathan hickman i think at some point um they look at it and say you know we need to reboot we need to number one we need to uh, we need to rebirth we need you know so it's always looking for that new no reason to have a new number one um and there when you have a new number one you always need a new team um so i think that's something to do with it these days too and, and it's a shame because like for example there's no way that chris claremont could have written the dark phoenix saga in five or six issues he well, just, not, that not just dark phoenix i mean you i mean you look at dark phoenix but he he came on the book he one wayne was the one that wrote giant size so one wayne introduced us to storm and Colossus, uh, the brought Wolverine over, and Night, he introduced us to Nightcrawler. He introduced us to that whole new team, and it was Chris Claremont who took up the reins the very next issue, and he defined those characters because they didn't exist before. 
Um, he de- he defined them. He did the Dark Phoenix saga. Uh, you know, I mean, he he had lasting uh, runs with so many different artists. I mean, you have he did so much with John Byrne. He did so much with John Romita. I mean, his his work with Jim Lee. I mean, it it just goes on and on and on. Um, and the book never dropped in quality. Never dropped in quality. That's that's absolutely right. Um, it's just something I would like to see comics get back to, like find the right pairing of artist and creator and assign them to the book that can either take it to the next level or just make it take off. I think what gets in the way today is the need to package them as a graphic novel. And I guess graphic novels work best in five or six issue formats. So you're always – there's probably editorial pushing teams to those five or six issues instead of longer. Uh, and there's always editorial saying, let's start over. We need a new number one. We need a, a fresh something in here to get people to buy it again. And that doesn't seem like it's going to change, unfortunately. Yeah, you're never going to really see someone just have the reins for a title for, you know, decade, a couple decades. I, mean, I don't think you're ever going to see that again. I, I really doubt it, but but that being said, Dan Slott did have a nice run on Spider Man, so yeah, you never yeah, know. He certainly did. Yeah, he was he was made for that character. Um, he was, and uh, I didn't follow the whole run, but I know that the Superior Spider Man was excellent. I mean, who would have oh, thought? Excellent. Who would have thought you could do? What was it uh, a year, two years? How long did that title last for? Superior, uh, where, like thirty. Yeah, it seems like it was more than a year. It seems, yeah, I mean, about three years. And he took one of Spider-Man's worst villains and showed that maybe he could become a hero in a in a, in a roundabout, weird kind of way, and not the kind of hero we'd expect, but a a type of hero, and it worked mar- marvelously. It was so brilliantly done, and yeah. like fans were furious. How dare you kill Peter Parker? Um, but like Dan Slott, I mean, you, you, I mean, he he had he made the reader's faith pay off. He really did. Right. Um, and even but even the, a care, you know, even back to like Denny O'Neill and 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 ways he made readers question things. You know, the whole Superior Spider-Man. You have one of his worst enemies. I mean, he's done heinous things. And yet you see that he's capable of, you know, loving this, uh, the, what was her name, uh, the, the scientist lady. Um, and, oh, and his love uh, for her was real. I mean, yeah. it, it wasn't, you know, I mean, it, it, no matter how bad he was, he still had redeeming qualities. Yeah. No, it, it was, it definitely challenged um, the readers, but that was, that was the one thing Dan Slott was really good at. And like you said, uh, he was good at on that particular title. And like you said, he had such a long run. I, I remember somebody asking me where the best place to jump on Dan Slott's run was. And I thought, like, my first response to him was ends of the earth. But the more I thought about it, I'm like, I don't know if there is a good starting point for Dan Slott's run other than to jump on at the very beginning, the first issue that Slott wrote. Yeah. I mean, he, he kind of like Jeff John weaved a 10 year story. Dan Slott kind of did the same thing. Yeah. I mean, uh, Dan Slott certainly is to Marvel what, what Jeff Johns was to DC, uh, for that era. Absolutely. So get back to the artist conversation. Now we're kind of bouncing all over the place, but, like, who are some of the other artists that um, that you are fans of? Um, you know, some that I think might deserve more recognition. recognition. Um, the book I was t- talking about, uh, Birds of Prey, that just came out a week or so ago from Brian, Brian Azzarello. Amazing artwork inside by Emmanuel Lupacino. I mean, she her art style is is beautiful. Um, mm. Some of the some of the very best, um, and I love the way she, her her characters just have that classic look to them. Um, it really shocks me that more people don't talk about her and are, don't seem aware of her as, as they probably should be. 
You know, I feel that way about Joel Jones, and I'm not sure if you know who I'm talking about. But oh, of course, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I feel like that's a name that's not spoken of. Yeah, she that started was... that uh, – what's that title of hers over at Dark Horse? It was really good. Um, the, the, you know what I'm talking about? The female spy. Oh, um, yes. Oh, God. It was – so it, was a great, it was a great title. Uh, that's that's what brought her into the industry, and uh, pretty soon after that, she moved right into Batman, um, high profile book, and knocked that out of the park. Beautiful artwork, and uh, then she had the whole Catwoman series to herself. Yeah, I just feel like her name is not circulated as much as it maybe should be. Absolutely, um, yeah. She is certainly one of the best out there today. Yeah. You know, to to kind of tailgate onto the variant topic that we broached earlier, um, one of my favorite current trends or recent trends in comics are what are called virgin variants or minimal variants. And for the listeners that may not know what that is, if you look at a comic book cover, any comic book cover, you've got the art and you've also got the masthead and the UPC code and maybe some text describing what's happening in that issue. A virgin variant has just the art. There's no UPC code. There's no logo. And, and some of them are absolutely beautiful. Um, yeah. All that stuff, are they're on the back of the book. But I've become a huge fan of those in recent months. And it was like and, a year and a half ago, I think, too, that DC, or maybe it was longer, that DC decided to – because. They, their stance that for a long time had been uh, two covers of each issue and, and both would be cover priced, not limited. And the variant, uh, they would take the logo off and just have a tiny little type written logo at the very top with the art team on it and writer. Um, so it's it's almost a version variant um, because there's just that tiny little title on it. And it, it works so much better. It, it really, just like you said, I mean, you're going to buy a comic for the cover. I think that's when they realized, yeah, people will buy a comic just for the cover, and that's why Virgin Variants exist. Oh, sure, sure. Um, one of my favorite artists who has done many Virgin Variants is Stephanie Hans. Um, yeah, she's I'm not, I'm not sure. I looked before we began recording, and I looked. I couldn't find a book that she worked on uh, the interior art for the book regularly. I think she's just a cover. I rem no, no. I remember her. Um, I remember her first on Journey into Mystery. Um, I believe it was cover. It was definitely covers. I can't remember if she did the interiors on those or not. Um, I think it might have just been covers. But I remember she did Journey into Mystery at Marvel, which was a Thor tie-in. Uh, then she re most recently um, she had been working at Image a little bit, and um, I know there's a great Image title. From Kieran Gillian, uh, one of the best writers out there over at Image, uh, just started a book called Die last year about um, some gamers and a, a mystical die and a, the person gets lost. It's it's a great, great series. Yeah, her art, she does interiors in there, and they're really beautiful. Um, I'm also a big fan of Alex Malieve. And oh, yeah, if, absolutely. And if the listeners may not know who Alex Malieve is, Alex Malieve, worked on Daredevil for a long time, and he was paired with um, uh, Brian Michael Bendis for most of Bendis' run on Daredevil. And Malik has a Amazing very... Run. Yeah. Oh, it, it's fantastic. If, if you've never read Daredevil, Bendis' run is a fantastic place to start. I would say start with Frank Miller, and then you can just fast forward right up to Bendis. And especially um, the Malik part of his run, yeah. Yeah, he has a very ethereal style, for lack of a better term, um, and it's it just works so perfectly for Daredevil. Yeah, um, it, he's an artist that's always uh, struck me as, as incredibly talented, um, and his covers just jump off the shelf. Uh, interiors are stunning as well. It, it, it's weird, I haven't... I don't recall seeing him put out work for quite a while. I wonder what he's been working on lately, but um No, nor have I. Nor have I. 
I should I should look into that and maybe I it's can. It's been a while. I mean, yeah, he he had the run on Daredevil. He worked at Marvel. I know he had a he did a Shield series with Bendis as well. Uh, they, I know they had a character Scarlet, I believe. Um, I can't recall. He, I know he left Marvel, but I don't remember. I don't think he did a whole lot after he left Marvel. Oh, he's he's been um actually he's over at DC lately. Yeah, he's been uh on Bendis's um Leviathan stuff. He's been oh, working okay. on that Leviathan uh, series. They had a mini series, Leviathan. I think it's coming up with another mini series off the other mini series. So okay. that's where he's been uh, working on that lately. Okay. Okay. But yeah, it's it's not really a high profile project like his other work. Yeah. Um, were there any other artists that you wanted to spotlight? Or you know, when when you talk about um, Malieve, uh, another artist that comes to mind that. Um, is just as striking to me, uh, Lee Bermejo. And I mean, his, he doesn't do a whole lot of interiors, but his, his covers are, are stunning. Um, he did the Joker, uh, graphic novel with Azarella that, that, uh, really holds up that people really love. Yeah. Oh, Bermejo, yeah. Bermejo just has a really amazing style. It's, it looks so lifelike and gritty. Uh, he did the, uh, the, uh, um, controversial Batman uh, series with Azarello um, a while back. It was very hard to find. Did he um, work on the Luthor story? The the um, I don't know if it was a, a mini... It had to be a mini series. You can find it in the graphic novel uh, section at your I LCS. believe so. Yeah, I believe okay, you did. So he yeah. worked with Azarello on I that? believe you're right, yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, you know, some other artists that really come to mind would be uh, Nicola Scott. I think she's stunning. Oh, yeah. I think yeah, her stuff's beautiful. I, 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 I wonder why her. people don't notice her more or talk about her more. Um, no matter what she does, it's beautiful. It, it, it really is. She she has done some Wonder Woman. Uh, I don't know if she's done covers. I, I, I follow her on Instagram, and she posts some of her work on there. But, like, some of the art she's drawn of Wonder Woman is just mind-boggling good yeah yeah wonder woman birds of prey um I believe she did back girl um and she did a image comic with greg rucka black magic that they own together uh anything she does is just phenomenal um i think i think she was discovered at a comic book convention she lives in really? australia yeah she lives in australia she'd gone to a convention she was just discovered by um, showing off her portfolio. Hmm. So yeah, that's all that's, I think I think that's how she got on Birds of Prey. And another Maybe. another artist who kind of reminds me of Nicola Scott's style. Um, you can see I think he's starting to get more notor- notoriety and more high profile projects. Clay Mann, uh, his stuff's really great too. Okay. The last the last big project he did was uh, uh, Heroes in Crisis, the Tom King story. Hmm. What is your opinion on, and I'm asking this for a specific reason, what is your opinion on Alex Ross as an artist? And the reason I'm asking is I I think Alex Ross has no peer. Let me start there. Alex Ross is just incredible. Um, I think that he, the characters that he draws, he, he makes them larger than life. But I heard someone on a podcast saying the other day that they didn't like the way he drew superheroes because they thought that superheroes should live in a fantastical world and not be so lifelike and realistic. I mean, I get that, but I, I just, Alex Ross is without compare to me. And it's almost, I, I would, I would, I would, I would say that, but you know, I have, there are some excellent painters out there as well. I mean, I've even had like uh, I think I wore it recently. I have a T-shirt, a, a Green Arrow shirt, and I think people look at it and said Alex Ross, and I'm like, no, it's Matt Wagner. But I mean, Matt Wagner's painting almost looks like Alex Ross. I mean, there there are some really talented artists that that can get close to what he does. Um, but yeah, I agree. I mean, his what he does overall for for superheroes and in his body of work uh nobody can really compare with that um it's it, you know it, it it 
makes them seem lifelike. It brings them off the page, and that there is a I mean, wonderment. There, there is a wonderment there. I think in in seeing a, a superhero you're so familiar with look so lifelike and and so real. That I the, think that's, that's what the people perfect word. With. That's the perfect word. The wonderment. Yeah. The the way Alex Ross, for example, draws Superman is just incredible. And I I read that Superman is Alex Ross's favorite character. I I seem to recall seeing a segment on him on CBS Sunday morning or something several years ago. And apparently he has an entire room in his house dedicated to Superman memorabilia. Wow. Yeah. He, you know, I, he, I, do, I do share something with Alex Ross, and that's the fact that both of us have the same favorite movie of all time, Flash Gordon. Um, any Flash Gordon documentary, I always see him interviewed saying what an, an amazing impression it made on him. And he's made uh, incredible Flash Gordon art over the years, too. He designed the action figures, and uh, just the, the the artwork he's done for Flash Gordon is, is as stunning as anything, too. I did know that about you. I did not know that about him. I knew that was your favorite movie, but I did not know that about him. Yeah, there's an excellent documentary I watched recently, uh, Life with Flash, and he's on there, too. Um, it's, it's amazing to see what a, uh, what that movie did to him as a kid and how it – you know, influenced his his artwork as a as an adult. Um, what kind of lasting effect it had. Uh, and and uh, when you talk about wonderment too, I mean it it really, I think you go back to how he first entered the comics field, which was the Marvel's uh, limited series with Kurt Busiek, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. which was just looking looking at those heroes in a fresh eye for the very first time, and and looking at stuff we knew about the old stories from the '60s. But with a totally different eye, which which is through Alex Ross's eyes. Right, right. So, any uh, any final thoughts as we wrap up this conversation on, I guess, the art of art? Uh, you know, there's there's a great book that just came out uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, finally, came out. I know uh, I, I got to meet Terry Dodson at Heroes Con years ago, uh, an artist I always liked a lot, and he was sitting next to Matt Fraction and. I remember he said, well, next year we'll have a book out and we'll promote it, and I never heard of it ever again. And it's finally out all these years later, a um, couple years anyway. Uh, Adventure Man number one, it's only $4, and it seems like it's twice as thick as a $4 comic. And I've always been a fan of Dodson, written by Fraction, and I'm looking at it, and I, I just forgot how amazing his interiors are. I mean, he is he's a phenomenal um, artist, and not just a cover artist. I mean, his interiors are stunning. I can probably go on and, and name another half dozen artists that I love. Like I love David Finch, uh, Darwin yeah. Cook, you know. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. He was, there's going to be no one else like Cook. I mean, he was phenomenal. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was that was a sad loss, uh, as was Michael Turner. Uh, Michael yeah. Turner had, had – to me, Michael Turner had not yet scratched the surface of what he could have achieved. Yeah. Um, but – you know, we could probably go on for hours about our favorite artists, and maybe we'll do another episode sometime down the road. But Sounds good. Um, I would love to have our listeners drop us a comment and let us know who your favorite artists are um, and tell us who and why. Just let us know why. Um, I want to thank Let Make Star sure to subscribe Bob. to the channel, and, you know, if you like what you're like listening to us, give us a thumbs up and – Love to see your comments. Give us a thumbs up. Give us a share. Uh, drop us some comments. Um, I want to thank Starpot Log for having us back. Um, if you like what Tony and I are doing, let Starpod Log know. You can find them on Facebook. Uh, you can find them on Twitter. I'm not sure if they're on Instagram or not, but um, definitely like and subscribe to their YouTube channel. And we're glad to have us back each time and glad for you to join us each time. So wrapping up for the comic scene on Starpod Log, my name is Jeff Wiley. And I'm Tony Barletta. Thanks for listening. Make sure you hit that subscribe button and join our Facebook group. Live long and may the force be with you. Nanu Nanu. Nanu.